are now tuned in to the OSINT Curious Podcast. All right. Welcome to the very first OSINT Curious webcast slash podcast. Uh, my name is Kirby Plessis and you, I, I call me Kerbster. Um, with us, we have a crew of six today. We've got Dutch. Hi. We've got Micah. Hello. Ginsburg. Hello. Technoset. Hi. And Sector. Good evening. All right. <laughs> so um, our inaugural edition of this webcast, we are just going to kind of cover a, a couple of light topics. Um, the first thing is how we came together. So actually, I'm going to point to Micah in my screen. <laughs> I don't know where I am on your screen, Micah, but, but how'd you bring us together, Micah? Well, uh, it actually was, was uh, as a result of working with Dutch and Technozette and some other people and Sector and Ben over in Laurent, who's, uh, oh, sorry, who's uh, going to be joining us on another podcast. We were at the DexXL conference over in Amsterdam. We just started talking about how there's a lot of fragmentation in the world of OSINT learning and really in the OSINT community. And that fragmentation uh, provides opportunity for misinformation, disinformation, bad information to go out. And the six of us decided that it would be great to have a single place where we could go to have reliable, good quality community content. Not that somebody's trying to sell you stuff or, or trying to get you to buy a product or whatever. Um, just honest to God, good quality content from trusted people. And uh, yeah, we, we sat down and, and started working on this and we're like, okay, well, we're going to need a domain name. I was like, I've got OSINT Curious. And, and so we just started rolling from there and uh, came together. You sound a little too happy about having that domain already. So I had actually been using that, that name, OSINT Curious, in my classes to talk to people about the mindset that you need to be uh, an OSINTer, to be a, an investigator, if you will. You know, you, um, in cybersecurity classes, uh, you know, I teach SANS classes. Mm -hmm. In most of the SANS classes, we teach, hey, don't click and tell your users, don't click shit, right? Uh, don't click on the phishing links. To, well, with us the more places you click on web pages, the more interesting stuff you see them, the more you, exactly. you, you get curious and, and just try stuff, the more likely you are to, to find interesting data. So I started saying, hey, it's OSINT Curious. You gotta be OSINT Curious. And so I bought the domain name. That's awesome, I did not know that. Yeah. I'd, I'd agree with the, the clicking things, you find interesting stuff. You find that a lot of times in the groups that you speak with, I mean, in my case, you look at a website and they'll see part of the website, but they won't see the peripheral buttons at all. They don't yeah. even see. Exactly. Need to, you get yeah, a sixth sense for off. that kind of stuff. You look for, you don't look for the content on the site, you look for the buttons. Yeah. yeah. And well, the URLs. Well, let's think exactly. about the URL. Can I find a pattern? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that goes to a lot of the stuff that we talk about just in our, in our group is, is how do you start doing OSINT? Well, you got to get the fundamentals. The more you know about how the web works or how social networks work or how computers are networked, the more effective you're going to be at harvesting that data. Um, one of the best examples that I, I, I love showing people is, is Gravatar. Uh, the gravatar.com site. If you pull up somebody's name in Gravatar, like gravatar.com uh, slash webreacher, it shows you some information. But if you click on the JSON portion, you just click on the JSON link, it'll show you more information um, just by clicking that little link that many people are like, I don't know what JSON is, so I'm going to ignore it. It shows you extra information. Yeah. So that's how I got here. What about what about you, Ginsburg? How'd you get here? And we've lost him. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, hey. the earbuds. Hey, Ginsburg, how'd you get here? Still having audio problems. Yeah. Well. Oh. Well, all right. Um. Let's let's talk about uh, some of our inspirations, our online inspirations. I I want to highlight that we're not trying to duplicate anything anybody is already doing. In fact, I think just alone, just seeing us, six of us here, this is a little unique for OSINT podcast, webcast. But um, who are our inspirations online? Um, I would like to take that one. Um, 
Initially, for me, it was uh, Bazel, of course, because his name is all over there. When I started this, well, I think it's 10, 15 years ago now, he was the only place to go to then for us in Europe. Mm -hmm. And then there was more. I had um, a guy called Arno Reuser in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah. he's, uh, he's a real character to see, but he was my, I see him as my mentor. So. Mm -hmm. And then it's you guys, of course. When they, when when you roll in deeper, it's you guys. We, I think there is, and uh, I think everybody is my inspiration. It can be an article, it can be a person, but initially it was Bazel and Roser for me. You know, I met Arno Roser um, sometime back in 2008, I think, when we had a maybe it was before that. There was an OSINT conference in DC. Yeah, he's definitely a character, and I've been following his stuff online for some time. There's also some other librarians I used to follow online, um, and still, in some cases, still do, that were fantastic. Um, but, yeah, yeah, big inspirations. Yeah. Check what about set? you, Is that Check set? Yeah, well, I must agree with uh, Dutch Oceans for much mm -hmm. of the, the names he, he named in the, um, just now. Uh, and Dutch has been an inspiration for me too because, uh, yeah, because he got into OSINT far before me. So he's one of the people I look up to when I'm doing my research. Yeah. And you guys too, of course. <laughs> Sector, do you have anybody to kind of shout out for as an inspiration? Oh, um, well, absolutely. Loads of people, loads of people. Um, when I look at this screen here, um, I see, for instance, uh, Dutch has really good information on um, covering your tracks online. If you do research, for instance, he knows a lot about that. I've learned uh, a lot of things about that. Um, Micah is just, just one big source of, of information. <laughs> Sorry, I've got to try not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can laugh. That was good. Yeah, really cute to see. We'll blur the face. We'll blur the face. It'll be Absolutely. fun. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, when I started doing my uh, my weekly newsletter in May, uh, so many people that I found that are creating tools or sharing tips and, and so many people. So I, like Dutch also said, I learn from everyone and everything that I read online. Yeah, I have a question for for you all. Um, I've been, you know, I, traditionally I, I grew up in cyber, and in cyber everybody just shared stuff, or you retain stuff in a, a repository just for you, your friends, your team, and stuff, and you didn't share that stuff. But but you know, tips, techniques, uh, tricks, tools, um, we would classically just make them and, and shout them out there and and share them with everybody. Uh, but I didn't find that to be the case in OS in the OSINT world, in the OSINT community. Up until about two, I'd say two to three years ago, um, it was a very closed world where, you know, you knew what you knew and you'd talk to these people, and but you wouldn't talk to those people. And are you finding that the OSINT community is becoming more open or not so much? I think it's the same. I think you just needed to know where to look. Like you said, some people would talk to certain people. I guess the thing is like knowing who was sharing and who wasn't because they're – I mean, right now we're seeing this explosion of the Start Me pages, but there's been other homemade web pages that have been out there for years. So I think that people have been sharing. It's just you need to know where to look and who to listen to. I totally agree with you, Kirps. Um, I'm, I think it was two, three days ago, I went over some really old links of mine and I found a bookmark that I probably created somewhere around 2010 or 2011. And it's just a collection of open sources aimed uh, at the Netherlands. So it has been out there for a long, long time. You just have, just have to know where to look. Yeah, and maybe now it's more community where we're actually like pushing it out rather than you just put your link there and then whoever you know sees it. What I, what I do um, see, miss in this community is that people uh, will share links and tools, but they do not often share how to use those tools or mm -hmm. describe it tutorial wise. That's what mm -hmm. I'm missing a lot. They just drop it. I do it myself also, but I, I would like to see people uh, write up some more the steps they have taken, the investigative steps or the, the, and the intelligent steps they took to come to an end product. Well, that's uh, what I, I like about the recent blog uh, sector wrote about how to use SunCalc 
on the question Micah actually asked him about how to identify at what time a certain Google Maps picture was taken. I found it very interesting. It's a very short, very clear tutorial on how to use SunCalc. Well, and I just read something this morning. It was written on January 5th, and I just pulled up the blog post here. Um, and it's somebody's 2019 guide. And I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. If your name's not yeah, it's from Rand. Like yeah, randhome.io. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's a 2019 guide. I was going through it. There's methodology and all. And it comes to the tooling section. I thought this was just absolutely in sync with what you're saying Dutch it says tools do not matter it is what you do with the tools that matter and it's really the shortest section in the entire blog um, I really I really thought that was uh, that was that that was dead on you know it's it, we don't teach people how to use a screwdriver we teach people how to fix things and you use a screwdriver to do that fixing so it's the mm -hmm. method that matters it's true yeah. well maybe it's an idea for uh, the website I was curious if um, maybe and once in a while, you, we just create a blog and just go over maybe two or three important tools um, that you can run against social media, for instance, or scraping websites and just uh, <coughs> uh, options that you can add and stuff like that. Yeah, we could, um, you know, have each give us a give a different way of how we use the tools because how I use a tool might be different than how Dutch does, and we can swap how we use it so that. We both use it more efficiently. Yeah, you probably use it the right way. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by town. All right. What's this? All right. I've just muted him. Huh. Ginsburg okay. is trying to come in, back in on the audio. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, uh, so uh, for me, uh, you know, while I was doing a lot of the, the di deep dive into the world of OSINT, what I found was the people I looked up to were the ones on this screen. You know, I was, I, when I heard your talks at Nova and your talk at uh, Nova, uh, besides Nova Kirby, I was like, holy cow, that's so cool the way she does this international stuff. And when I saw Dutch do like some Twitter stuff, um, I, I just love the fact that, that you're sharing stuff and you're, uh, um, helping everybody get smarter. Yeah, I think our whole OSINT careerist group, we are very much um, sharing with each other and like bouncing off each other. So there's a synergy there. Yeah. All right, so now let's talk about um, the blog entries that we had in the OSINT Curious that we just did. I mean, we did all of our intros. So if anyone really wants to know more about us, they can go check out our intros and then leap out to our own pages. But let's talk about the topical blogs. So, should I start off with um, the Python one? Oh, you can hear us, okay, Ginsburg's back in. Yeah, and we can hear you typing too, Ginsburg. Oh, and he's gone. And he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, hey, let's start with the Python one. All Sector, right. Didn't you do some of that? Um, I did do a little bit on it. Um, I went over um, a couple of uh, tools that are mentioned over there. And I'm, oh, I'm on a new PC, so I'm going to uh, ask someone else to start because I'm sure. going to open something up. So I did, I did a little bit of stuff, but I think Laurent did the, the most, the major part of the, uh, the Python blog post. Uh, that was something that was requested by people in the OSIN community, and uh, we have on our website OSIN Curie curio.us uh, we have links for if you want us to discuss a certain topic or to write a blog post about a certain topic happy to do that and somebody actually wrote in hey can you show me how to use python for things and Laurent wrote a really neat um, blog post that that sector and i added content to about how to use python now the thing that that I found is that you don't have to use Python if you know Go or Ruby or uh, heck even PowerShell you can be really effective at doing scripting and in fact if you don't know any of those languages you still can leverage the tools that other people have written absolutely one of the major advantages of uh, Python is that a lot of tools that you find for instance on github are written in Python and there's loads and loads of code online uh, that deals with interactions 
uh, web interactions towards uh, social media or websites. So Python is very powerful, and I think that is why it's also very popular um, in the community, in the OSINT, in the info information security community. Uh, it has been embraced for years already by uh, by pen testers, but also investigators. So there's a lot, a lot out there. Yeah, but keep it, things, Go ahead, Dutch. But keep in mind, I see most people still using Python 2.7, and it's 3.7 you need to use. You okay. really need to start because support will drop soon. 3.6 and up. That's absolutely well, important. And it's even getting more confusing because like some of the vir I have multiple virtual machines I've been working on this past week and, and some of them the default is now Python 3.x and, and some of them the default is 2.7 so in each one I've got to figure out is this is this tool written for Python 3 or 4 or 3 or 4, 3 or 2 and and uh, are the modules installed, the libraries installed that I needed. Um, yeah. it, it's getting confusing but it'll sort itself out. Yeah, we needed to get uh, Justin Seitz in here for this topic. Yes. <laughs> He's Mr. Python. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I'm hoping to see more and more of, and I saw it recently with a tool called DNS Twist. It's a yeah. command line tool that we've been using for a while with uh, with domain squatting or, or domain... Um, uh, where somebody will register like goggle.com and try to trick people into going there instead of them going to google.com, taking advantage of typos. Um, that's been a Python script for a while, but somebody just made the DNS twister.report website, which uses that as the back end, but they put on a really nice web front end to it and it's super fast. So yeah, you might be using Python, but not even knowing you're using Python because people that uh, whose websites you're using are using Python in the background. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, how about the next uh, article that we have up, the puppeteer, the OSINT puppeteer. And I know that was Technoset and Dutch that took the lead on the, that one. Yes, we definitely did. Well, I wrote a good part of it and um, Dutch really had some good uh, addings to the blog too. So yeah, having um, sock puppets, or people might call it fake profiles, I prefer sock puppets. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crucial when you're doing research. You need to get a, hand, uh, get a hold of certain information, especially on social networking sites. You need to have a way in, and a way in is most of the time is the sock puppets. And making them, creating them has becoming harder and harder these days because of course, a lot of social media deal with the issue of having fake news on there, on, on those platforms. So they need to have good algorithms detecting the fake news because like Facebook cannot uh, monitor their whole entire community by hand. So they definitely will have algorithms detecting how fast will you create an account or uh, what kind of information you're putting on there. Is it just links or are you just searching or, uh, and Twitter does the same too. So yeah, you need to have a good setup before you create your account. Um, and that's probably the most important thing about creating sub puppets, I think. Yeah. But you need to, that's exactly what you say, you need to think of your persona. Uh, you have to give it an identity, a place to live, hobbies, all that kind of stuff. But you also need to think of your operational security. When you set up a sock puppet, do it with a dedicated email account. Do it with a dedicated IP address or at least uh, put it behind a, a VPN. All that kind of stuff. But also be online in the time zone your sock puppet lives in. Yes, and be active. Don't just only search or uh, only look at information. Click around and be awesome and curious. Check out other things. Don't um, like blend in with the crowd. Make sure you, your behavior uh, on a website you're visiting doesn't ring any alarm bells. If it's normal for somebody who is visiting a website to click on home or click on a contact button or click on a program or whatever, do it. Also, if it doesn't, um, if your research only is focused on finding a certain email address, for instance, make sure to just click around and yeah, don't um, make sure, just make sure your behavior blends in with a normal visitor of the site. 
I, I will add also that in some cases you have um, groups who aren't allowed to do much on with their research accounts. That's what I call them as research accounts most of the time um, or stock puppets, whatever. Um, they're allowed to create one to use it to search. They're not allowed to make friends with anyone. They're not allowed. Those, those accounts aren't going to last long. Um, no. I can understand, you know, the reasoning for that because they want to make sure that they, that, this trail of evidence doesn't go into any other cases, doesn't brought, you know, breach any privacy or contact regulations, policies. Um, but the, it's getting harder and harder to keep your account when you, when you have that kind of regulation. So the clicking around is a good one if you can, if you can get away with um, that without that being a problem. But sometimes having, again, activity on your account, which I know you um, both Dutch and Technicide have talked about, using IFT. That's what I do if I'm trying to keep account alive. Yes. I just automate it with IFT and then just kind of walk away for a while. And what I'm also finding is the older the account, the better. So if you can make a couple accounts automating with IFT, and even even if you're if you're more worried about it, even deactivate them for a while. Come back to them later. Let them age a little bit. Yeah. So and when the, you yeah. said IFT, do you mean if this then that, right? Exactly. Ifttt.com. That's right. Because mm -hmm. you're not in the know about automation and apps. No, it's all right. <laughs> and, I've, and I've heard uh, you, Kipser, talk about Microsoft Flow in the past. Do you still oh, use yeah. that? I do still use that. Um, Microsoft Flow is a lot more difficult than IFT, so most of the time I'll tell people to use IFT first. And if you're familiar with the old Yahoo pipes or the other old oh, pipes yeah. type programs, that's kind of how you, that's Microsoft Flow because you have a lot more things you have to put together. It's a little bit more difficult to understand. IFT is easy. Stringify. Stringify, awesome. yep. So those two would be the beginner level. And, and also, I mean, you can set up a whole bunch of stuff on IFT. And whereas in the case of um, uh, Microsoft Flow, it, unless you have a license, you only have five, you know, five free flows. Yeah, Stringify is nice because you can do more than just if this, then that. You can do if this and that then do these things. And so it allows you more conditionals, but it also allows you more actions. Well, also, IFT has a Stringify channel. Ooh. Yeah, so you can do Stringify through IFT. Wow. And yeah, you can link a whole bunch of stuff together. But can you guys give an example of what kind of things you do with if this and that? What do you automate? So as an example for the sock puppet thing, I would maybe say anytime there's a picture tagged sunset on Twitter, then maybe I would have it posted to my Facebook page that I'm trying to keep alive. And so that my user posts sunsets or um, she doesn't even need to post sunset. If you have a sunset post on um, Flickr that's geolocated in a certain place, you can have that your person, you know, tweet out something completely unrelated, you know, just something that it adds a little bit of difference there, but yeah. No, I do the same. I do the same also for uh, sports uh, clubs. When you do uh, the scores and that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's pretty decent stuff to automate. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm back. Hey, welcome back, Hi. Ginsburg. I was having all sorts of troubles. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Do you stock puppets, right. Ginsburg? Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I love IFTTT, uh, if whatever we're going to call it. Um, so depending upon the target, and for a lot of the stuff that I use it for is a lot more kind of <clears throat> using the OSINT to gain leverage in regards to a social, uh, social engineering way. Um, so I would go through and use a lot of the, uh, the recipes to go through and to either bolster, you know, the account with fresh stuff there that may be, you know, wanting to be picked up by some of the interest groups or whatever that I'm trying to go through and track or something, or it may be something where like I am trying to prof profile somebody via Facebook for interests and try to be friends with them. So I will go through and post like-minded type things to go through and to make that stock a more attractive uh, follower or friend or something like that. So there's been some stuff with that that I've used in the past. Um, also for dead socks or not current socks or socks that I haven't given purpose to, um, it's really nice to go through and do a broad range of different topics. Um, manually doing some of those inserts is very, it helps a lot to go through and keep it where it's not, you know, getting flagged by Facebook or any of the other social media accounts to, um, to say this is a, a bot or a, a dead account or something like that. So. Cool. Great. 
Yeah. All right. So um, let's talk about some of the news, some of the things that we've seen just around OSINT world in the last week or so. If you guys can, uh, I'll start off. There's a um, Justin Sites just posted about oh, yeah. uh, if you are researching something using a virtual or uh, using a VPN, you're using Tor, whatever, but you share a link in something like Skype for sure, he says, maybe Slack. And I would say since there's previews in anything, when you share the link, if the link creates that automated preview, it may have just given you away because now it's grabbing IP addresses from whoever is viewing the preview or, or from Skype itself or something. So yeah. what do you guys think about that? You guys saw that? Yeah, I saw the article. It was really good. It was really good. It made you think um, it was good for OPSEC for both ends of the party, in my opinion. It mm -hmm. could be the investigator or maybe the criminal or the other party you're looking into because they do the same thing. It's not mm -hmm. always our vision. We research. We, we are supposed to be the good guys, mm -hmm. but the bad guys can fuck up too. Oh, yeah. Always looking for when they do, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyone else on this subject? Nope. Anybody else have no, anything? I, okay. Go ahead, Gins. Oh, no, it's okay. I was just going to say it was it was a, a really good article, um, and I know that um, Justin and I think it was Mike Bazell were kind of going back and forth in regards to uh, geolocating like postal codes and stuff like that through uh, links they were sending each other. Um, that was like the even if they were on a VPN, it was geotagging to certain locations. And at least you can get a, a somewhat specific, um, you know, depending upon where your exit was and your VPN or depending upon what, what router you were using for your home stuff, whatever, you know, there was, there was traces in there that were showing, Hey, this is, you're close to, you know, either Quebec or you're close to Austin or something like that or whatever. So uh, that was that, kind of neat. Was that the, the nearest, was? the nearest airport thing? Justin and Bazel yeah. were talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was the CDN, the CDN, uh, the CDN uh, URL string. There was a reference into a specific IP range, which could be traced back to mostly airports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Is that due to the Wi-Fi sniffing? I have no idea why. It's a special. Uh, they pointed out it was an Instagram, mm -hmm. and when you grab a picture and you grab the URL. Of oh, right. I saw Instagram, and that was the CDN code, and that referred back to the nearest airport. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I did see that blog. And so I'm wondering, though, I'm wondering, like, how it gets going forward. So I know that, you know, you're on a VPN or you're on tour, and your IP address could be anywhere. But if your Wi-Fi location sniffing is on, then it could report your location regardless. And I'm I, think, I wondered if it was like a traceback thing, whatever, if it was, if it was just how the, the shortest signal to like the ASN stuff, whatever, where it's like, you know, uh, but I, I, I'm not sure cause I haven't looked more into it, but yeah, it did seem like, you know, they were, it was, it was not from the URL you sent. It was from the traffic packets that, that were being captured. So. But uh, the explanation was because the CDNs, they need to uh, deliver the information as fast as possible. So it, all, it will always choose the nearest one. Mm -hmm. mm. That was the main explanation of it, and which makes sense in a way. But still, if I send, if I grab a picture from Instagram here, over here in the Netherlands, and I will send it over to you, Kerbster, it mm -hmm. could tell where I'm at. Right. So, Just the picture itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. What, what I've also found interesting this week was an uh, article, and maybe it was last night, it was this week, 5 December, Kyle McDonald posted on Medium an article on how to recognize uh, fake AI-generated AI images, the deep fake recognition. Oh, article. I'm so interested in finding the deep fake stuff. It was so, it was really interesting. It was, it, he really was a perfect write-up on how you can spot a deep fake. It was based on asymmetry, uh, mm -hmm. teeth being not uh, placed right, hair and background pictures being blurry and weird. It was really interesting. You should really look it up if you didn't look into it. Yeah, I didn't see it, so mm. I'm going to have to look into that. I am following that deepfakes um, section on Reddit. There's, it's not terribly active right now, but uh, I think it, you know, it will be. And I think there's going to be, besides you know, the image recognition kind of ways to tell it, there's going to be technical hints too, just like in the EXIF data or something. Yeah. So there was another article that I saw that came out. It was a while back about generating um, pictures from like three or four different, like you would take three or four different real pictures and it would auto generate 
pulling bits like the eyes, the nose, the skin tones, and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and using um, like AI to go through and create new avatars and stuff like that, or whatever, that were completely fake people, but <clears throat> had you know real lifelike um, you know kind of features and things like that, or whatever. And there were there was a whole white paper on that stuff that I was looking at. It was a while back, but yeah, that seemed cool. Yeah, um, that's to help fool and maybe get your account on Facebook. You could post your picture and they would say, yep. okay, you're a real human. You can continue. And they, they don't have you in any database anywhere else already. So, right. yeah, definitely very interesting. Yeah. So, Doctor, you do a roundup. What have you seen this week? Well, <laughs> I've, I've been uh, going over a lot of uh, older um, tools and websites because um, I stopped doing my week in OSIN newsletter for a couple of weeks. I really needed a break. Um, well, to, tomorrow, 7th of January, it's going to be back on again. I'm going to go over a few of the older links and there are two very interesting things. One of them is already from December and that is, of course, remove background. Um, it was tweeted by uh, Eric Toller, <clears throat> and you can just upload a photo of someone, and it automatically removes the the background of the image of the person. So it it is extremely powerful. It is it works really really well. And they also say just combine it with Yandex Image Search if you need more photos of the same person, because Yandex is doing an awful good job in recognizing faces. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the biggest tools uh, at the moment. So it is also going to be covered again uh, this Monday because it really deserves a lot of recognition because that is one heck of a tool. Yeah, it saves you a lot of time and you don't have to trace out the whole person's outline and then do Photoshop and stuff. Um, So uh, an article that I was talking uh, about was the... um, I just said, oh, Huawei, how Huawei uh, found some of their staff and, well, they they got really upset at some of their staff and actually fired some of them, I think, um, that was tweeting out using an iPhone from their ori- from their, their actual account, uh, their Twitter account. So, you know, it, it, we in the OSINT world have known for a while that you could tap into the, the application. We could see the application that somebody used to uh, send a tweet or even do some other things. Uh, if you tap into the API of Twitter, but now Twitter is showing that information along with the tweet. And so you can look and say, hey, this is a Huawei not sent from a Huawei device. That's interesting. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. We used this a while ago f- to, to determine uh, what people were sending and, and what devices they were using. But I thought that was kind of interesting coming, uh, coming back to the forefront. Yeah, that same there kind of, even... uh, uh, well, that yeah, same go ahead, go ahead. technology where, uh, you can see like what they're using. We used to use it to see if, if tweets were automated to say, hey, is that person tweeting or what, what are they using? They're using Hootsuite to re-automate it. So maybe they're not really actively tweeting at the moment. They just have it preloaded. Yeah. That was also something that people were doing with uh, like when Trump's uh, tweets were going out. <clears throat> Trump was, you know, tweeting specifically from like an iPhone or something. So you could tell when his staffers were tweeting because it was coming from an Android type device as opposed to the iPhone, you know. Um, you, so you got it that reversed. was another. Oh, was it, was it the other way? I thought he. Yeah. Okay, sorry, fam. And, and I. But you know I, who created that? <laughs> I know a little bit about that because I created a, a Twitter bot called Is It Trump that did that well, exactly. That, okay, that's right. Yeah. That's yep. right. yeah. And it looked at his tweets and said if it was from, it looked at via the API, the Twitter API and said, if it's sent from an Android, then take a picture of it so that if the tweet's deleted, we still have a, a picture of it. Take a picture of it and then say this was most likely from uh, Trump. If it was sent from anything else like an iPhone or an iPad or uh, the web client, then it was tweeted out with, hey, this is most likely not him. Um, so, yeah, we've been doing that for a number of years now. Yes. But now he uses yeah, iPhone I, too, so. Or it seems that's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. And maybe that's the reason why I confused it, because I knew he was recently on an iPhone, which, and, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. The presidential iPhones. The bulletproof. 
Uh, yeah. They can also hover, and they can take down. No, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all spy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so I look, what was I, it? it used to be the BlackBerry, right? It used to be the BlackBerry that would hard code and stuff for the presidential yep. stuff. Yeah. Yep. Uh, to my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge. Um, but user agents are amazing. I mean, going back to what you were saying, because really that's all it is, is, is your application, whether it's TweetDeck or Hootsuite or, or if this, then that is saying, is sending a little string of words to Twitter saying, this is what I came from. That's also tamperable, right? I mean, since we're sending it along with our tweets and all, we can make that say whatever we want. So if somebody wanted to get stealthy, if they wanted to get not evil, but, but crafty, you could send stuff from your iPhone or whatever and have it say that it's coming from an Android. Um, it's, it's all customizable. It takes a little bit of skill. Yeah, I used to see all the homemade um, Twitter apps coming through with all di sorts of different stuff. Now you don't see as many of that anymore, but yeah. yeah. Everything we do it from again. tweeted mm -hmm. from curb to speaking. Um, speaking of um, the user agent, though, Facebook, when you automate your pop sucker with ift, it says so. So make sure, I mean, mm -hmm. you look yeah. on Facebook, it says from, from ift. So, you know, you got to also keep in mind that somebody who knows what that is is going to know that it's automated. Sure. Even Twitter's doing that. Well, obviously, Twitter's doing that now, too, but I just saw that yesterday where. It was tweeting, and it's, and it's from Ift, and I was like, oh, well, shit. Okay. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. Check that out. Dutch, uh -oh. Dutch we can't hear you. Yeah. He's muted. Yep. Telling you, it wasn't just me having uh, audio issues. I don't know what happened with my, my computer. I couldn't, get my, I couldn't get sound coming from my computer or the headphones or anything. It was, it was quite frustrating. So I'm actually dialed in from my phone and on the, the account there. Um, what I wanted to say was, because my mic is working now again, mm -hmm. um, isn't it so that Facebook only shows it w on the web version and not on the mobile version, the IFT? Mm, I don't know about that. Because you used to, mm -hmm. uh, because I used to do a trick doing backdating posts, which mm -hmm. can change the date of a post. I post it today, but I can backdate it to like two, three years ago which makes it seem that my account was already existing for two or three years. But it, that's cool. You can only see it when you hover over it, the post title name, when you, in the web version and the mobile version, you won't even see it. Nice. I don't but know if it still it. works because I haven't used that trick for a long time ago, but you, you could edit a, a post or a message and change the date and backdate it. Would you backdate it from before your account was created? So like yeah. create a yeah. But you can but you can but you can delete the, the date and time your account was created. So it wasn't you couldn't right. change it. Your Facebook ID will will show that because it's it's uh, fairly back. linear. Uh, yeah. that was something that Josh Huff saw, found out. And he put it in Bazell's book was that that kind of a beautiful graph of each of the uh, Facebook IDs built is is bigger than the last one. Yeah, I love to um, kind of show how that backdating works. I have people like you know, when you play with the URL and you do some searches on Facebook, we look for mullets from the 1980s, and you find them. You find backdated stuff to the 80s in there. So, so I've noted that noticed that. Um, so I I deleted a lot of my accounts on Facebook. Um, I, I deleted my account on Facebook. Sorry, uh, and. Uh, what I noticed is that when I would upload a picture of me from the 70s or 80s, it would put the date that it was posted. It, not the date it was posted. It would put. It would change some data about the actual post to be the original date of that picture or whatever was in the metadata that that was uh, about mm -hmm. that picture. So even though Facebook didn't exist when I was younger, mm -hmm. uh, it was doing some of that automatically without me doing uh, it. Yeah. But some of these photos, I mean, well, it's from the 80s. They weren't digital in the first place. There's no metadata. True. So somebody had to backdate them. Yeah. Mullets are back. Skullets. About to get one. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> what else is happening out in the world? It was not that much, right? Because it was the holidays. Uh, there was a ton of stuff that just came through. Oh, Bellingcat got yeah. a job. Got a job opening. 
Oh yeah. Oh yep. yeah. Oh, how about that twenty three and me? The twenty. It's not OC. Yeah. Was it G GSK is buying yeah. twenty three and me or something like that? Glaxo Smith um, What was that? Yeah. I missed that one. So twenty three and me is that that you spit in a tube and then they analyze your your DNA and hundreds of millions of or lots of people in the United States and all around the world have been submitting their DNA to this twenty three and me thing. Well, Glaxo Smith Klein, the pharmaceutical company, said. We'll take all that data for three hundred billion, probably. Something like and, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they're buying they're they're buying twenty three and me and all of that DNA stuff, all of that DNA data, that is all going with it. So you submitted it to one company, somebody else says thank you, and now you have a company that's bent on that's pharmaceuticals that's going to be able to test those drugs against those oh wow! DNA. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't do it. So any of your family members, relatives did it. Yep. Yeah. It's, so it's, and that's been a big thing for me. Whatever in the uh, <clears throat> in the medical industry, a lot of like uh, you know there was a there was a I don't know if it was Supreme Court, but there was a high ruling court case that came out and said you know if a doctor or a medical staff takes blood from you or something like that or whatever, and they find a cure for something, or if they find you know a weird gene, or if they find something in your blood. And they can go through and patent it, even though it's your genetic material or whatever it was. And the reason being is because just because you have it, you don't know how to go through and act on it. You can't go through and actually isolate the, the whatever it is that they need to go through and to do whatever they're going to do with it. So um, that's always been one of those things where I've been very cautious because even though it's your either genetic material or blood or whatever it is, whatever, like you own that, but you don't own the right to it. It's like mineral rights for your body kind of thing. So that's always been a weird thing um, at least in the u.s mineral rights for your body i'm telling you wow i'm a wordsmith that's pretty good <laughs> <laughs> well technozette you said that you had you're gonna have to take off soon do you have any yes. parting words yeah give some shout outs to me. stay oh and curious people where can people <laughs> find you technozette uh, well, you can find me on Twitter uh, with my Twitter handle, TechnoZ, or go to TechnoZ.com and see all the tools I've gathered so far. And hopefully stay tuned for 2019 because I'm hoping that there will be a new website designed for me. So, yeah. Right. Very nice. Cool. Yeah, your Start Me page whatever, is really, really spot on. So we really appreciate like all the stuff you put into that. It's awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think it's becoming so big nowadays that I myself find it very hard to find things I've put on there because sometimes yeah. I know what the the description was which I put with the domain but I don't remember the domain so I want to search in everything I commented underneath uh, under all of the domains but for some reason that's not really working out so um, I've been discussing with a a friend of mine who designs websites to build me a better searchable database. Mostly for me and for everybody else, hopefully. It would be really awesome to make it searchable. Yeah. So you can say, well, I need a tool for Twitter to do X, Y, Z, and uh, you'll immediately see if there are any relevant results in my data set. I really also think it is about time that uh, we need to get some more structure in all the links. Don't you agree, Micah? Yeah. As soon as I have some time, uh, I'm going to try to re-spark that ORCS project, the Ocean Resource Classification System that I pitched. Uh, um, just uh, life got in the way and uh, didn't have time. But, yeah, I would love to be able to classify and tag different resources because you're right. I mean – Technozet, your site, uh, Bruno Mortier's site, yeah. uh, these things have hundreds or thousands of links on them. And it, it, I got to imagine it's incredible to maintain, but also stuff gets uh, lost in the fray and did you classify it as mm -hmm. this or that? So yes. um, that's one of my projects for 2019 and hopefully I'll be able to, we'll, we'll make some progress on that. Yeah, I know like OSINT uh, framework, you know, even just him putting the links together for that for Justin Nardine, uh, you know, dead links and new links and, um, you know, things that are developed in the future and adding all that stuff. That takes a lot of time and stuff. So the Orch project is really exciting for me just because it is 
kind of a, a it's it's kind of born out of both worlds where a lot of people used to use GitHub to go through and to keep all the bookmarks and things like that in one space. Um, it wasn't visually, um, you know, very representational. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it'll be good. I, I think it's a it's a worthy project. So I'm I'm happy to help out with that stuff as well. Cool. I'll make sure that whenever my new website is like being built and stuff, I'll make sure you guys can have a sneak peek to see uh, if it might be working like better with all the categories and stuff. So yeah. Awesome. Good luck on that. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Good luck. I'll be signing off for now and have a good rest of the podcast. All right. Bye. Check right. Take, care. Take care. I see that. Um, Micah, you, ha you wanted to talk about the Weather Channel. Yeah, there was a news article that came out this past week where it said that the we some uh, person has accused the Weather Channel of their of of ha harvesting geolocation data from the people who installed their app on their phone. So, so I install the Weather Channel's app on my phone, and essentially hundreds or thousand one of the reports is like 14,000 times in one day the weather app was sending information back about where that person or where that device was and then they were selling that to um to other companies and uh that was that was interesting because i mean you know as OSINT people we always think about that we're like oh i'm not going to install that app it needs access to this or it's going to do this and you suspect this but when you actually see it come to pass. You, you got to smile and nod and go, yep, knew that was going to happen. You know, and it's not just the Weather Channel app, because I think they also own Weatherbug, right? And Weatherbug was the big one that they got the data from. Ah. And I believe um, a few weeks ago that Bazell actually talked about something like that on one of his podcasts, too. Really? Yeah. Is, I'm sorry. Oh, we have call-in user. <laughs> uh, call in. No, that's a eight... Sorry, that was on mine. It's an 866 call in. Uh, I just got to figure out how to turn it off on my laptop now. That's there we go. Another cut section. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Thank by you the way, know. this is uh, Skype. Don't click on any links or any previews. It's not letting me do anything with That's it. Right. You guys want me to answer and we can, we can all talk to him? Yeah, let's say, answer it. Oh, well, now it's, now it's finally done, I think. <laughs> An 866 number. So in other words, that is most definitely uh, maybe one of those. I, I've been getting a lot of the uh, spam with Chinese language. Ah. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So you, you need to update your Microsoft probably. Yeah, probably. No, that's <laughs> different. I need though because I, I can't even understand them anyway. Like sometimes, you know, so. Well, that was actually kind of neat. Um, mm -hmm. well, I, thinking about those Windows update call centers, you know, where they're like, hey, we're calling from Windows, you have Trojan on your system, and then they make you go to the event viewer to pull up just a regular error. It's like, oh my God, help me. Um, yeah. In one of my classes over in Singapore, I had some people from Microsoft in there, and mm -hmm. they said, and, you know, they just, we just talked about some things, and then in London, I had some other people from Microsoft, and they said, hey, did you meet the Microsoft people in Singapore? I was like, yeah. And they said, well, those are the people that just shut down 12 of those Windows help desk call oh, centers nice. uh, in police things. I was like, cool. It's about time somebody's doing something about those. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, we also have a link, Ginsburg. You wanted to talk about the ETF. So, Trace Lab. Yeah. I don't, I, has anyone else ever worked with them or done anything? Trace Lab is um they perform like OSINT CTFs um they're basing their CTF off of missing people or missing persons reports um they have a global one they've been doing some stuff at like b-sides um i think they had a um, a a presence at defcon i don't think they really did anything I, i'm not sure i wasn't at defcon this last year <clears throat> um but i know that they are very heavily invested in the OSINT community I know that uh, there's a lot of people that speak very highly of them. I know that it's a nonprofit and it's run by basically one guy. Um, he's got a lot of help and stuff, uh, but they will come on site for a lot of stuff and they will, they will do a virtual or a physical like kind of CTF for OSINT and stuff. I just, I didn't know, and this isn't a plug for them. I, I think it's a neat thing, but I've never worked with them or done anything with them. Uh, I'm planning on having them come out maybe in Kansas city in April for the B side thing but I didn't know if anybody had worked with them or seen anything in the past or worked 
anything similar um, since it is kind of a missing persons thing? No, oh, I've – Go ahead. Dutch. I've, I noticed it last year. It really popped up in all my timelines uh, at DEF CON. Mm. That's, that's where they popped up. And initially, people were reacted annoyed because they didn't announce, announce their sales in some kind of way. But I don't care if they're doing good and they're tracing missing persons who need to be traced. Uh, that's good stuff. Uh, isn't um, Chris Hagney doing the same thing? Yep. Yeah, Chris Hadnagy is doing the uh, Innocent Lives Foundation. So it's another OSINT for good. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the Trace Labs. I, I do remember seeing it. I don't remember looking into it, but I know that Chris Hadnagy has a lot of ties in with law enforcement, vets the people that are doing the actual open source intelligence. And and it's not really a CTF. It's definitely uh, uh, foundation work, nonprofit work. So that, that was yeah. always my question is, is how are they – how are they working the, hey, we have a whole bunch of untrained but well-meaning people going out and looking at all this information and coming up with results uh, for these missing people? I, I, I don't know how they aggregate all that data and how they, they, uh, they work on it, but they did say that they found, you know, like two or three people or more. So yeah, that's what they said um, in the, I think it was either the Portland or in British Columbia or something like that, yeah, where they had a CTF. Yeah. And there was like, they said four out of nine or something like that. So I don't know where they're getting the use cases for. Uh, I'm not sure what, what information is being vetted. I don't know, you know, if I, I don't know how much training, because when I talked to the guy, he said that there's, you know, there's a startup or whatever. Um, and for the, for the software and for the stuff, it takes about half an hour, an hour to get up and running for, you know, the CTS. So it is, it is still a point style flag style game. Um, so I'm not sure if this is, older cases where they've either found the person so they can, you know, run the entire course of the investigation. I would imagine they're not doing live or cold cases in regards to people who are still missing. I could be wrong. Um, it's happened before, uh, but I don't know like where they're getting their information, but I'm interested to find out what it is. Um, the IFL or the innocent lives foundation stuff uh, is, is a little bit different and that is completely vetted. Um, which is very nice. And I know that that has a social engineering aspect to it, but that's the, the focus is on the OSINT, the actual, um, you know, actually collecting investigatable data and using that to turn over for prosecution type thing. So that stuff has to go through its paces a little bit more because it has to, you know, with, with every court, with every state, with every country, there's, there's certain things that they have to go through and have for it to be actionable data in a court of law. So, you know, sometimes you can't use VPNs or Tor because you have to make sure that what you're seeing is actual, you know, not not from a, a virtual machine or something. It has to be tagged and stuff. Uh, and I'm not an expert in regards to that stuff at all, so don't 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 hate on me in comments. But um, I know that that at least is a little bit more of a of a standardized process stuff. But I'm I'm interested in this trace lab thing. I think it's going to be interesting. I would love to see more stuff like that. I think. You know, OSINT in itself has kind of come out in the last, you know, five years as, you know, a real, I don't, I don't want to say it wasn't a discipline before, but there's a lot of people who are actually seeing the value of OSINT and not just as a means for social engineering or a means to go through and footprints for, you know, penetration testing and stuff like that. This has real actionable um, intelligence that, you know, you can use in day-to-day -day stuff and it's kind of bleeding into other areas outside of, you know, infosec and marketing, which is really nice. So this is kind of one of those things that's kind of an offshoot, um, but I'm interested to see how this plays out and what their actual process is. I just, I wasn't sure if anybody else had actually talked about it or seen anything uh, from these guys. So I bring it up. Yeah. We'll, we'll share the link in the uh, podcast and the webcast as we go along. So if anybody's interested, they can definitely click through. And so it, I'm reading the, the rules right now, the mm -hmm. CTF rules, and it does say that, I mean, they're, you're working real cases. At the, It says, uh, at the end of the contest, the context organizers will send local law enforcement everything we collect. So I think it is real uh, people, real cases that, that people are looking on, and I'm guessing the people at Trace Lab will decide what's real, what's authentic, what's useful, and what's not. Um, yeah, that yeah. goes into verification. Yep. Hey, weren't yeah, weren't we just talking about are, that, Kerry? Um, they yeah. are indeed live cases because um, I've read about them somewhat earlier last year, one of the first times uh, they held it. Um, they do seek out certain 
people. They look for people that um, that are probably want to be found. If there are people that that left and do not want to be found, for instance, uh, they'll probably not go after them. So they look for cases that can bring some kind of closure in what way ever. Um, and they do indeed give out points, uh, some basic points. If you find some leads or some older posts, uh, you get some more points. If you find new social media platforms where they, uh, where those people registered, um, even more points if you find like employee data and all that kind of stuff. So that, that is the whole CTF uh, thing behind it. But it is indeed true. They are looking for missing people. Mm. Can, I, very interesting. can I add one more thing for what we noticed in the news last week? I oh, just it's no. had it. Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just had, I just, uh, the 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 W the M W OSINT guy he posted on how the OSINT landscape is going to change. I found mm-hmm. it a really interesting article, not not specifically the article, but a discussion it made loose all over the internet. Mm-hmm. What's your guys' opinion on his article? I totally agree. Um, you also have my opinion. Um, yes, we do live in the golden age of OSINT. At the no, moment, no. Um, well, okay, uh, you, you say no, but um, at, at, at this moment, there's so much stuff that is open that can be used. Whether it's social media, whether it's satellite imagery, whether it is databases with newsletters and stuff like that, there is so much that is open and freely available on the internet at the moment that it it is it's almost incomprehensible so much information you have to sift through to, to, to find whatever you need. Um, on the other hand, it opens up a whole wide range of possibilities in uh, re- regards to investigations. Um, I do think that uh, privacy concerns um, that are popping up since a couple of years and especially with facebook of course being the big bad bully that things are probably going to be a little bit more difficult but i still think that as long as people want to share stuff with the uh the outside world as long as people want to share their uh, selfie with a hamburger on some kind of social media website, there is still stuff to be found. And I, I don't think that OSINT is going to get harder. It, it just changes. The tools change, or the website that you have to look at change. Uh, the connections that you make uh, might change, but I don't think it's, it's going to be uh, over anytime soon. I'd agree with that. I mean, I, I've been working 100% OSINT since 2003. That's been my whole, and it's been, it's just been up, down, up, down, tools change. You find the next one, people abandon my space. Next thing, everything's on Twitter and Facebook. It's just, things just change. It's not going away. No, I mean, now we've got the whole wearable age coming in and the IOT age coming in, which brings just new platforms to dig into and all the ones will go away. And still Facebook with all of its candles, people stay. They will, they will only dip for a few months and people stay. They even gain new members still. So, Yeah, we're going to wait for the next disruptive tech for that, but then they'll all go to that one and we'll just get that information somewhere else. It's just, um, yeah. like Sector said, people want to share information. And I don't think you can shut, you know, close that, you know, put Pandora back in the box, you know, close that door anymore. It's, it's open. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of things, especially with social media stuff, um, I think that there is a <clears throat> there is a, a way that people can get more active. And I, I agree with what he kind of said in regards to like the human aspect, whoever being more active as researchers. I think that will definitely increase. But you know, right now there's not a lot of policy in place for these privacies. Um, there's new tech, there's new platforms, and it's just moving so quick that legislators and other people can't really go through and stop the flow of information. I mean, when Tumblr decided that they were going to go through and stop all, you know, not safe for work images and things like that or whatever, there was a plethora of people or platforms that were willing to go through and step up. 
And as OSINT investigators, like you may not be aware of Pillow Fort or some of the other ones that were smaller and didn't have a whole lot of transactions, uh, you know, data sets and stuff like that over. But it's kind of nice because when these things, when one gets a momentous shift in policy because they're trying to either be bought by another corporation or they're trying to go through a, a appear more family friendly or whatever it is, you know, it, it just, it surfaces so many other um, places for you to go through and actually do investigation work. And some of the stuff is maybe even hiding in the shadows. So right now I think it's going to kind of be in a splinter effect for a lot of the social media stuff, which is, I think a good thing because it pops up on our radar. Uh, and also I think, you know, here maybe, in the next five years, two years, one year, whatever it is, you know, a lot of the people who are uh, big advocates of using, you know, either burner numbers or, you know, like pseudo and Google voice and things like that. I think it's going to make it to where the investigation, you know, you have a primary number that is tied to a person. And then also you have these secondary numbers that will have to go through and kind of be ranked as, you know, uh, VoIP numbers or burner numbers and stuff like that. And then you'll have to associate those with those social media platforms. So I think it's going to get, um, automation, I think, is going to be something that's really important in the future. Uh, but I think it's also going to be kind of the devil in the details with a lot of that stuff. So I think I, I think there's obviously it's not going to go away anytime soon. I I don't think it's going to be total social engineering and you know and bots and stuff. But I, I definitely think that it's going to grow in a in a niche environment thing that we are starting to see. But we will really see um, here in the next five years stuff. One of the things I'm seeing more of is is the shift of of many of the the people that I deal with, not just in cyber, not just in OSINT, but but just normal people that I work with or or that I interact with, uh, that are now becoming more aware of of the dangers of sharing in social media. I, I shared this I think at the the Dex conference. I hurt my foot this past year and, and I was seeing a physical therapist for, for many months and uh, I was working with one of them and, and she was doing something on my foot and, and uh, she said, can you find, you do that searching stuff. Can you find me? I was like, uh, I don't want to play this game. And then, you know, I said, well, you know, I'd probably do this, these types of things. And then another physical therapist walked up and she said, well, you, could you find me? And I was thinking, ah, oh, come on. You just heard how I would find this other person. And she said, no, I have like three different Facebooks using four different emails. And I don't use the same avatar. I use different names. None of them are tied to me. I'm like, holy cow, you know, <laughs> let's talk about this. Because, I mean, and she's just like a normal, well, not, not necessarily a normal, but she's just a regular person that's already has this increased OPSEC and awareness that social media is, is something that can be used against you. And that social media sharing and what you share to what audiences is uh, very, very interesting. Um, in my class recently, I had some, some people that said, hey, you know what, a lot of our younger, um, well, let's say teenage uh, targets, they have their regular Instagram that's friends with mommy and daddy and very professional. And then they have their Finstas, their fake Instagrams where, you know, that's where they're doing all the, the nastier stuff or the less appropriate it's stuff. It's not even necessarily nasty or less appropriate. I think my niece, they just don't want their parents seeing that stuff. They don't want the sure, interest. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. But, and I, I've actually talked to teens as well. They're doing something similar, but they, uh, you know, when, when it comes to their, their main account, they'll know that, but then the side account that they have, whatever, if they lose the password or something else happens or whatever, or if they forget it, they don't care. So they'll burn it and they'll make a new one. And it's like, they're saying, we're not doing this for OPSEC. You know, I'm par paraphrasing. We're not doing this for OPSEC. We're doing this because we're lazy and we forgot our password. And that's okay. I think as a, as a, as a, you know, burner account thing, whatever, because like at that point, it's not your consistent lifeline, but it's the one that they're consistently on. So that's the one they're searching. So that kind of gives them a different persona, which I think is kind of an interesting, although it'd be a lazy way to go through and do it. But I thought that was kind of a neat, um, you know, because this is, this is coming into the generation where they're actually, you know, we came into a lot of the, you know, we get to have the internet and it's dial up and all that stuff, but they're coming into the mobile, the phone, the IOT stuff like that. So, they don't care because creating accounts doesn't cost anything to them, you know, so. But, it, but you know what the side effect is that's going to be? Is that their friends are not going to know whether that new account with that person's picture with a new name is actually the person that, that just lost their account or whether it's somebody like you or me. 
right? So that, yep. that provides opportunity for us to, to do social engineering types of connections and all. Um, also, it gives you input to find them as well, because what you end up doing, instead of having to, you know, connect them to the main, t main phone number, map the friends. Yep. yep. Map the friends. That's the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Are we, we're about ready to wrap up. I want to make sure I give everybody a chance to give a shout out to someone and then also tell me, uh, tell everyone how they, people can find you online. So Dutch, do you want to go ahead and go first? Uh, no. Well, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> technically already went first. So. Well, that's true. Okay, Dutch, do you want to go second? <laughs> I want to go second. Um, no specific shout out. Well, I want to give a shout out. I want to give a shout out to Ben, Benjamin Strick. Because um, in my opinion, he's a very shy guy, but he's so talented. He is so talented at what he does. So that's my shout out for this week. That guy, you should all keep an eye on. All right. And where can we find you online? Him? You. You. Uh, me. You can find me uh, on, at Dutch underscore Ocean Guy on Twitter and the same handle on LinkedIn. All right. Yeah. Micah. So, um, you can find me wherever. I'm Web Breacher on many different platforms um, and you know, webbreacher.com, of course. Um, I don't really have any shout outs right now, so I'm going to just take a pass on this one and uh, go ahead and give my time to the senator from Ginsburg. -ia. Okay, Ginsburg. Good work. Uh, Ginsburg5150, um, you can find me on Twitter there. That's Probably the most relevant uh, place to go find anything because if there's anything else, then I'll post it there. Um, and I want to give a shout out to crepes because they're delicious. Oh, okay. All right, food truck. Nice. Sector. Yeah, I'm going to uh, give a shout out to Christian Trebert, a uh, fellow Dutchman from, uh, from Bellingcat, because, well, he's the one that actually wrote a blog post about geolocation and uh, the QuizTime account on Twitter. Um, I got very heavily involved in that. I uh, started uh, developing a lot more, and then, yeah, just from there on, I, I just also started to look more into OSINT stuff. And, uh, yeah, one thing led to another, and now I'm here. So he definitely deserves a little shout-out. Um, Sector035, you can find me anywhere. Just uh, Twitter mostly, uh, medium medium.com. Uh, com. Loads and loads of write-ups and uh, weekly newsletters and more to come. Awesome. All right. And uh, my shout-out, I'm going to actually shout-out this platform we're using right now. So this is Zoom.us. Um, we looked quite a bit, Mike and I, to try and figure out a platform that would give us the grid of people and very happy to see this one. So um, that's when I'm going to give my shout out. Also free for most people. I mean, you can do 40 minute uh, videos and find me, Curbster, on Twitter and at Plessis.net online. Great. Cool. Thanks, right. everybody. Well, we'll see you next week then. Bye.